dear audience, welcome to the UM6P studio. I am Wi Amuddin, a UM6P student, and today I'll be having an interview with the professor, the writer, the scientist, Madame Louise Fresco. Madame Louise Fresco, welcome among us and thank you for accepting our invitation. So, the audience would love to know more about you. So, the floor is yours to introduce yourself. Well, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Louise Fresco. I am a Dutch national from the Netherlands, but I actually grew up in a French-speaking environment mainly. And I went to study agriculture, tropical agriculture, uh, at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And the reason I chose that, which was very unusual, my father was a professor of philosophy, and uh, the idea was not at all for me to become uh, uh, an agriculture engineer, but it was really because I was very moved by the problems uh, that I saw at the time uh, of hunger in Africa and so on. And I thought that I had to do something useful with my life. And first of all, I wanted to do medicine, tropical medicine. And then I thought, no, because if you uh, heal people, you give them medicine, but then they still don't have to eat. It's not a good idea. So in the end, I became a, an agricultural engineer in tropical agriculture at Wageningen. And uh, already during my studies, I spent nearly a year in Zambia, working uh, with farmers and especially women farmers. And after my graduation, I immediately left first for Papua New Guinea, which is at the Pacific side of the world. And then later on, I also went for the Congo for a long time. I lived there for four years in the, in the middle of nowhere, I should say. And afterwards, I worked in many, many African countries and also in countries in Latin America and Asia. Um, and then I spent uh, quite a bit of time between university and the United Nations. I became the Assistant Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. And I was responsible for a lot of negotiations on agriculture and also helping countries to formulate their agriculture policies. And lastly, it sounds like a long list, huh? Um, I became the president of my own university, Wageningen University, where I just served two terms and I just stepped down uh, really quite recently. That's a so interesting story. You have a, a such great education uh, life and so on. Um, my question would be, uh, what make you or what made you pursue a career in agronomy and agriculture? Well, as I said, I really wanted to make a difference and um, I felt I wanted to do something that, that would really help other people. Uh, and of course, hunger is such a pervasive problem and so is inequality and so is um, the poor chances that women are have. So I felt on all these uh, counts, I wanted to do something useful. So that's why I, I chose the subject, which was certainly not uh, um, easy or, or, you know, it, people didn't think for a long time, for many, many years, uh, I always had to hear how come a nice girl like you is in such a boring subject. Now today, of course, agriculture is very much, uh, you know, in the limelight in many ways, but like 30, 40 years ago, when I chose my career, it wasn't. But I have not had any hesitation. I've been very happy in my work, and I think it has been useful also. Great, madam. So my following question would be, what impact has your work had on global food security? Well, that's a big question. And I think one always has to be modest about what you can achieve in one person's life. Um, when I started my studies, of course, I, I really wanted to help hungry people. But that was a very simple idea. Um, and of course, over time, you learn that you can never help everybody. And that also that sometimes more, the more you can do is more indirect than direct. So to give you a couple of examples, um, I did a lot of work on cassava. Now, cassava, when I started working on it, is really the, the, the poorest of the poor people's crops. It's, it's used in tropical areas. Uh, it hasn't got a good taste, but it's the only crop that survives when the soils are very poor. And I think I brought that again to the limelight. And I worked with some people in Nigeria at a certain time who were really trying to improve the nutritional qualities. And because it's a crop for poor people, improving those nutritional qualities is really quite important. Uh, 
it was me being one of the triggers. It's not me who has done everything. But to give you a very different example, um, I've worked very hard also on international negotiations in my time at the UNM uh, to have all the seeds of food crops as part, uh, declared as part of human heritage. So not having uh, national boundaries there, but saying, you know, whether a crop comes from Peru, like, uh, or like potato, or whether it comes from Asia, like rice, they should not be the property of one country or one company. The seeds should be in a, in a general kind of vault, uh, like a bank, mm -hmm. a gene bank for the whole world. And so in case something happens to the, the, the seed conservation in a country, they can then retrieve the seeds from our collective storage. And that is very important. So actually it was, uh, it was shown that uh, when the city of Aleppo in northern Syria, where, where I also worked, was bombed, uh, they lost their gene bank. And even in Ukraine, their gene bank was also bombed. But their seeds are somewhere in the north of Norway in a rock, and all those seeds are there and they can be retrieved. And of course, it's again, it's indirect because, you know, seeds doesn't yet mean that people can eat it, but it's very important also psychologically to decide collectively as all the countries in the world, this is not for one country or one person or one company. This is for mankind, humankind, humanity for the future. So that's so interesting, madam. Then I would like to ask you, uh, based on your own experience, your great experience. Um, what are the challenges that are facing us today in terms of ensuring the food, like the global food security? Yes, that's a very important question. There are a number of challenges. Let me say uh, at the beginning, I'm very positive that we are able to feed the world. At the end of this century, there will be 10 billion people or perhaps even 10 and a half or 11 billion. I think we can do that. But it won't go automatically right. But there's a lot of things that need to be done. And firstly, we need to find a balance between the areas where we have agriculture and the areas that we need to leave under natural ecosystems. And that is important because uh, natural ecosystems, particularly grasslands and forests, of course, fix a lot of carbon. And that helps, of course, with climate change. So we concentrate the agriculture on those areas that are either already uh, cut where the forest is already gone or the grasslands, but also where we can have the best possible yields because better yields means less area needed, but also less water, less transportation and so on. It, that whole process actually is called intensification. So we want sustainable intensification and uh, the, the, the basic three words that I always use is more with less more yields with uh, less water, less energy, less chemical or fewer chemicals, but getting a stable yield um, and protecting the soil is going to be very important. But that's not all because that's only the production side and we need uh, also to make sure that we, we use all the, the inputs in the right way so we don't fertilize too much, but also not too little. And I have to say Africa needs a lot of fertilizer. But also we need to look at what happens after the product comes from, from uh, the land because then it often is processed, you know, you don't eat when we are in our kitchens, we don't eat wheat, we eat bread. So somebody has to make the bread. So it's the whole food chain that counts. And like now we are still wasting about one third of what is on the land. It doesn't come onto the table of the consumer because it's wasted in the processing or at the harvest. So food waste reduction is a very important other aspect and enhancing nutritional qualities, especially for poor people, you know, you want wheat that has all the right vitamins, all the right uh, proteins as much as possible. And I think those are the great challenges and to do that well and to use, for example, for Africa also uh, the surface water. So Africa has a lot of water yes. more than any other continent. It has beautiful rivers, beautiful lakes, but we're not using them. Africa, Africa, south of the Sahara has less than 4% irrigated land. Now with new solar panel, panel, uh, panels, we can actually have localized uh, irrigation. And if we do smart irrigation with little drips and not just flooding, then we can have a completely new agriculture in Africa. So as you mentioned Africa, for you, what are, like, what are your thoughts about the future 
of agriculture in Africa as a continent, as you used to mention, with a high potential? Yes, I think absolutely. Africa is going to be the continent of the future because of its potential with young people, energetic people, with land, with water, with lots of solar radiation. So all that is possible. However, you and I also know that uh, it's not just enough that something is possible technically, it also has to be possible politically and economically. And there, there are still quite a few barriers. There are countries where governments don't function very well, but there are also a lot of countries that don't have a good agriculture policy that, uh, for example, favor imports uh, and, and there's not enough production uh, locally because it's not interesting to farmers. There are uh, major barriers, for example, in terms of customs, tariffs and so on. So all that needs to be part of an integrated po policy. And I, I would hope also that the African Union would push again for, for a real Africa food agriculture and environment policy and have that in an integrated way and also learn from, from one country, from one to another. There's a lot of expertise in Africa already. I really agree on what you just said, madam. So my, my last question, so last but not least, mm -hmm. what do you think uh, about the involvement of youth in uh, the evolution of the African agriculture? How do you think that we as youth can contribute in making the change and making uh, Africa the continent of the future? Oh, you are absolutely essential. And what I like most about young people in Africa is that they're not afraid of trying out new things. Because the idea is not that agriculture is going to be more of the same. We need new technologies, new ideas. And if you just look at what happens here at this university, new types of fertilizer, new types of, of, of seeds, of species, algae, um, uh, you know, quinoa, all these new things, but also having smart monitors, for example, sensors, all that is necessary. And I can see that the, the, the big transition Africa is, is not going to give people a, a better hole to work the, hand, the, uh, the land by hand. That's not going to be the future because then nobody wants to be a farmer but is to make agriculture into a high-tech endeavor where really entrepreneurship and, and energy is going to be put into place to get a completely new agriculture and I think Africa in that sense can lead the way because you have all these people who are so eager to do something and I think the knowledge you have really if we apply that to agriculture we're going to have the most innovative agriculture in the world. Thank you so much, Professor. It was a such it was such a pleasure to have you among Thank us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. us today and to have a such faithful and a great conversation with you. I would like to thank you again for being with us today. Thank you so much for the efforts you put in, just to make Africa uh, make more efforts and helping Africa become the continent of the future. And I really see that we can make it as youth and Africa is going to be the continent of the future. Thank you so much again. See you soon, madam, and see you soon, dear audience. Thank you for watching us. Thank you.